So here we have a problem for rotational inertia and it's let's start with the basics. It says that there's a sphere of radius 20 centimeters. So we know that the radius is given to us for 20 centimeters is that many meters and it has three significant figures so I kept that. Uh, the sphere has a mass of 1.8 kilograms so that's easy. They gave it in the right units. And uh, it rolls down an incline that is 10 meters long. Okay, let's draw that. Here's an incline. It's uh, 10 meters, 10.0 meters long. And uh, it's at an angle of 30 degrees. 30.0 degrees. So everything so far is using three significant figures. So we can focus on getting all our additions and multiplication up to three significant figures. So what do they want? They want the translational and rotational speeds. Um, before, you know, getting really confused by this question or any question, I like to think about what do I know? So I know that there's a sphere, and since they didn't say it was hollow, I'm going to assume that it's a healthy, full sphere, and there's no empty space inside the sphere. Um, and I always recommend for myself and others Think about what you know before getting into a problem. Uh, if you put up all the things you know, then you'll see a path to everything that you can find out as a result of it. So one of the things that I know is, hey, the incline is 10 meters long and at a 30 degrees. So one thing I can easily derive is the height at which this ball sits, right? And that's change in Y between the ground and the height of the ball. So that, that seems like a simple thing to kind of have on hand, just like I have a radius on hand and the mass on hand and the angle on hand. And why not have the height at which the sphere sits also available? They didn't ask me for it, but seems reasonable. Seems like one of the reasonable things I can derive using physics that I know or just basic trigonometry. So let's do this. What would be the height? So if we draw this figure, we would say that um, this is the hypotenuse. So let's use the mnemonic Sokatoa. Again, what do I know? I know this side is the hypotenuse. I know that this side is the adjacent. I know this side is the opposite. And so I know the angle and I know the hypotenuse. So I know the angle and I know the hypotenuse. So base, uh, sorry, this is wrong. Let's do that again. Cosine, so I know cosine of the angle, I can get that. Uh, the hypotenuse, I can get that. So I can find the adjacent, but that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for opposite. Again, the sine of the angle I can use, the hypotenuse I know. So hey, uh, I can find out what the opposite is. So let's focus on that. Sine of 30 degrees is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. Hypotenuse is 10.0 meters. So, we're using this one. That means 10.0 multiplied by sine of 30 degrees is the opposite side. And if you solve for that, that should be fairly simple. I'm just going to leave it like this. It makes crossing things out easier for me. And so now I know the height. Hey, once you know height of anything, you can find its potential energy, right? Potential energy has nothing to do with inclines. It just has to do with how high it is, how high it is sitting. So I'm still not solving for the things they asked. I'm just figuring out what do I know? Simple. So the potential energy is mass times gravity and how high it sits. Now I know the mass, it's 1.80 kilograms. We know gravity, it's 9.81 meters per second square. Or you can simplify by just putting 10 meters per second square if you like. Let's do that. Let's keep it really simple. 10.0 meters per second square. And the change in height is a sine of 30 degrees. Again, multiplied by 10.0 meters, right? So if you put that all together, um, you'll end up with something like 90.4 joules. So I know that the total energy of this system, potential energy, is 90 joules when it's on top. So 
So now we can focus on calculating its translational and rotational speeds because the total energy, potential energy on, on the top, it's not moving yet. So the total potential energy at top is equal to the kinetic energy, that's the translational, at the bottom, because at the bottom it'll have no potential energy, it became all kinetic energy, and it became two types of kinetic energy, the translational kinetic energy and the rotational kinetic energy. So there you go, it's a three-piece equation. You already know one of the 90 joules, one of the three parts. And now what they're asking us is for the other two parts. Hey, what's translational and what's the rotational speed? So we'll get there, but let's just think about the energy equations, right? Here we know that the formula. So what's the formula for translational kinetic energy? one half m oops m v square and what's the formula for rotational it's one half inertia whatever the special inertia formula based on the shape of the object is times um not the velocity but the angular velocity squared right so We've simplified, we know a number for one side, we know the formulas for the other two sides. What else, what else is there that we simply already know or can derive to move forward with this? So let's, let's think about that for a second. Um, well, maybe I could fill out the value of i. That, that would certainly be helpful, right? Uh, so let's go to Google for a second. What does the inertia formula for inertia for a solid sphere look like? Here it is. I equals two fifth m r square. All right, let's let's use that, and you can, if you have a reference sheet or uh, somewhere you're allowed to look for inertia, you can do that as well. So two fifth m r square. So we're gonna do that. Oops. Ninety. I'm just gonna stop using significant figures for a few seconds to make my life easy. One half so instead of i, we say two fifth mass times radius square and omega square how else can we simplify well if this is where a little bit of memorization helps we know that velocity is equal to the angular velocity multiplied by radius so if we want to get everything to be the same we can also say velocity divided by the radius is the angular velocity so let's take this and substitute it for w so here i'm going to say v over r squared so now this looks like a beast and i really wouldn't have expected anybody to start with this equation saying well it's so obvious to me and if you can good for you but i need to come here using the things i know you know building it up little by little and now i feel like i'm in a good place you know mass and velocity are the only variables in my equation and you know what i actually know what the mass is which means all I have to solve for is the velocity. Um, let me do another little tweak here. Let me try to cancel some things out. So instead of writing it as 90, let's take a look at what my equation was. mg times y, right? So that's how I got 90. So I'm going to write just mass times gravity. And change in y was 10, right? Uh, not 10, sorry. Uh, uh, it was sine of 30 times 10. Actually, that's if you solve for that. Uh, sine of 30 times 10 is 5 so mg times 5 so this height by the way was 5 meters I never solved for that but now I did so mg 5 it just makes everything so much easier to cancel out times 1 half 2 fifth mv square vr square very little math so far so I can factor out m from this side I can cancel out m in every single place gone what else can I do? Uh, the 2 and 2 goes away. Great. Um, what else? Let's see. What else can I get rid of? I'm just going to write it as 5g is equal to v square over 2. That's simple. And don't see how I can reduce that further. Plus v square. Oh, I'm doing this wrong. My mistake. This is mr square. 
let me just fix this. It was R squared. Uh, my bad handwriting got to me. R squared. R squared over, and M is gone, so just R squared over 5, multiplied by V squared over R squared. And that means these two go away. So I'm left with nothing but 5G equals V squared over 2 plus V squared over 5. Hey, that's, that looks easy. Um, so what, if you solve for that, you get 5G equals 0 0.7 v square if you're wondering how i did that it's just well i'll show it i guess 5v square plus 2v square over 5 times 2 is 10 and that's 7v square over 10 and 7 over 10 is 0.7 so that's why i end up with 5g equals 0.7 v square and then what is v well it's just 5g divided by 0.7 and square root the whole thing and if you solve for that <clears throat> velocity is 8.37 meters per second so we took a really long road but we built on what we knew none of this was magic or genius we just took a few things that we know we know how to find the height we know the potential energy we know that the potential energy has to equal the kinetic and rotational energies and we know this extra v is equal to angular velocity times r so we use we put these things together to get really far and now we actually have one of the things they asked for, translational speed. Now what is the rotational speed? Well, let's just go back here. 8.37, right? V equals W times R. We want to find W and we know what R is. It is 0 0.2, right? 0 0.200 meters. So the rotational, just divide 8.37 by 0 0.200. And that comes out to be 41.85 radians per second or since we're going with three significant figures 41.9 radians per second so here's the rotational speed of the sphere and here's the translational speed of the sphere done right easy uh, now the next part of the question asks us the ratio of one speed well not the speed of one kinetic energy to the other well we have the formulas already uh, so they want a to B, let's see, translational to rotational. So translational to rotational, right? What's well, what's the formula for translation? One half mv squared. And what's the formula for rotational? Well, let's use it in terms of mv squared. So that was something like one half times two fifth mr squared times vr squared, right? Just bringing it from there simple stuff right so and if you start canceling out again one half mv square and you know twos cancel out and the r square will cancel out with this r square then you'll be left with nothing but let's see one fifth m v squared and since m is on both sides of the ratio you can get rid of that right so you have v square over two ratio of v square over five Hmm, how does that work? Let's keep going. Well, we'll just say multiply both sides by 10, which means this side becomes 5v square, the other side becomes 2v square. Okay, well, what? how can we simplify further? Well, we can just get rid of v square, it's on both sides. So it's like a 5 to 2 ratio, and uh, I mean, the another way of looking at it. So this was translational, and this was rotational. If you keep simplifying, it's 2.5 to 1. So it depends how you write it. If you're looking for rotational to translational, it's 1 to 2.5. If you're looking for translational to relational, it's 2.5 to 1. And that's really all that there is. So that's the ratio. Next, they ask us, um, do the answers depend on the radius of the sphere? And I don't think if, so what they're saying is if the ra radius of the sphere was 0.1 meters or if the radius of the sphere was 100 meters, would anything have changed? Would the velocities or um, the ratios be any different? And they don't, right? Because the radius, uh, well, they do and they don't. Um, 
wherever in your equations the radius did not get cancelled out, it, it matters. And uh, so for example, when we calculated velocity, by the time you got to this part of the equation, right, 5g.7 v squared, that just shows you no matter what your radius may have been, you would be solving just for this much. So radius does not matter, it gets cancelled out. So for calculating translational velocity, it does not matter what the radius of the sphere is. But if you then look at how you calculate angular velocity, the radius is part of the equation. So the bigger the radius, the bigger your angular velocity will be. So then it does matter. So the answer to C is when I calculate my answers uh, for the angular velocity, radius matters. For translational velocity, radius does not matter. And that's all there is to it. Thanks for listening.